Hebrews. Now, we've shared over the past couple of weeks, we've shared out of Hebrews. If you've missed, if you've missed it, you've missed out. But don't worry, it's all online. You can go on the Kingsway app or you can go on the YouTube channel and um, catch up if you've missed a few things. I am going to refer to some of that this morning. But what is wonderful about the Word of God, it's always alive and it cuts like a two-edged sword and it will be doing that this morning. It will encourage, it will embolden. It will remove, it will restore, it will minister. And not because who prese- who's presenting it, because of who's the one that gave it. Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit is moving together as the Word is ministered to us. All right, so, so let's just pray together before we read this portion of, of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 4. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that through your Word you will come and minister to each and every one of us this morning. Lord, we know that personally and in our fleshly self, we've got nothing to give, but we do know that we are more than victors through your blood and through what you've done and through our salvation in you. We know, Lord, that you speak to us today, even as you've done uh, when Jesus was walking here on the earth. But Lord, you've, you've been speaking to mankind through all of history. And we pray, Lord, that even this morning, through your spirit, you will minister to us and you would make your word alive in us. And that you would send it forth to do what you've called it to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Now you can open your Bibles. The last portion that we did uh, the previous week was on Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. We're going to start there and then we're going to move into chapter 5. Just so that that you know, the the chapters and the verses, uh, they were not there originally. It was just the letter. So we put the chapters and the verses there. So this sermon, this portion of the sermon and, and this letter to the congregation here in Rome um, starts actually in verse 14. It says, therefore, verse 14 of Hebrews 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 5 verse 1, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with those who are uh, ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What a passage. And if we read it, we can, we can see from the very beginning, listen, this is not milk, this is meat. Yes? We can see there's a little bit of substance in this word. He's referring to Old Testament passages, and he's referring to, to Jesus and, and, and to the high priest, to Aaron, and, and, and showing how Jesus is a new high priest and showing us the order of Melchizedek. I'm not going to say a lot about that because that comes up in, in, uh, in the next, not the next chapter, the chapter after that. We see more about the order of Melchizedek. But I am going to minister to you and share with you what um, the Hebrew writer here shares about Jesus as our high priest, this great high priest that we have. 
Now, one thing we've got to understand, there's, there's so many things here in this passage that uh, it's impossible for me to share all of that, even in this short passage with you. But there's a few things that are really highlighted that he lifts out and that he wants to share with this small congregation struggling in this time to keep their heads above water. And he actually, in, in verse 14 yeah, of Hebrews chapter 4, he starts off, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest. We have a great high priest, but it's therefore, all right? When he starts with therefore, there's something leading into that. And if you want to catch up, you can catch up. But just simply, quickly, he, he showed us the, the fact that Christ is, is more than Moses. He's more than the angels. There's so much more to him than we can fathom or think or dream or imagine. Christ is everything and everything we've ever needed. Now, moving to this high priest of us, explaining to us why he's such a great high priest. He's saying, listen, we've got a great high priest. And then we've got a, he's, he's starting to explain to us why Jesus, as our high priest, is so much greater than anything else that they've known. Because for them, Jews as they were, they understood what the authority of a high priest, what that was. They knew exactly the authority, the fear of God, the, 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 the way that the high priest dealt with, with man's sin every year had to bring that before God. And we'll get into a little bit more of that now. But here they mention Aaron specifically as, uh, as, as the way we, how the high priest were chosen and, and, and what that entailed. So let me just quickly show you a few things here. If we take the, the passage in, in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. The first thing he wants them to understand is this, that a high priest has to be selected from the people. Not by the people. Big difference. A high priest is elected by God. God appointed Aaron as high priest. But he has to be selected from the people. Why? It says so that he could listen to this. It says a, a, a high priest is selected and appointed to represent people in matters related to God to offer gifts and, uh, uh, and sacrifices for their sins so that he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. Very important. A high priest had to have solidarity with the people that he represents. Because if a high priest, if he has no solidarity with the people, if it's not the same as the people he represents, then he would have no uh, um, understanding of what they are going through. Yes? You see, Aaron was elected and selected by God from the people so that he was able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray. Since he himself... Aaron himself was subject to weakness. You see, because when you bring these things together, God elects a high priest. God appointed Aaron and his family to be. Aaron was appointed as high priest. The Levites were ministering to God's people. They were this tribe that was separated unto God. But Aaron himself was a high priest elected by God to be high priest. We actually see that there was a stage in Israel's uh, journey right after what we dealt with the previous chapter in Hebrews. Right after they elected, they said, no, we are not going into the promised land. We don't think we're going to be able to survive. So they didn't go in and God said, okay, for your punishment, I'm going to send you back 40 years into the desert. Because you didn't want to enter the rest that I had for you. Now they went back and then a lot of prominent leaders rose up against Moses and Aaron. Korah led this. You can read this in Numbers chapter 16, chapter 17. You can see what happened there. There was a, there was a rebellion. And they said, listen, we're not going back into the desert. Who appointed you guys as our leaders? Who said it should be Aaron? Who said that, that you guys, do you want to make us slaves? They said, Korah, 
made a very, very valid argument. He said, listen, we as God's people, we are all holy. We are God's people. You want to make us slaves. We, 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 don't, want, we don't want to listen to you anymore. We'll appoint a leader. We'll appoint a high priest for ourselves. Let me make a long story short. What happened was Moses said, you do not know what you're doing. Please do not go this way. They rebelled against him because they wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to appoint a leader that they wanted to appoint. And what happened in the end, God brought judgment upon Korah, upon all of those that were with him. And in the end, the earth opened up and swallowed up all of them. This is in the Bible. You can go read that. Chapter 16. End of chapter 16, God destroys the rebels himself. And then a plague, because of their rebellion, kills the 14,700 of the Israelites. Because they rebelled against who God appointed. And Moses said, okay, Aaron. Now remember, they rebel, rebelled against Aaron and Moses. And when, when this plague was running through God's people, uh, Moses said to Aaron, Aaron, God told me, you've got to go and stand in the midst of the people, run to the middle of the people and ask God to forgive them. The same one that was rebelled against had to run and stand in the, in the center of God's people and say, God, please forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. They rebelled against what you have appointed. God, please stop this plague. And the plague stopped. But the one they rebel, rebelled against is the one that had to cry out to God because he was the one elected to be God's representative, uh, representative before the people and the people before God. Now the prophets gave the word, Moses gave the word to God, but Aaron was the one that had to represent the people before God and uh, uh, sacrifice, uh, bring the sacrifice offerings before God on behalf of the people. You might think a bit, but you know, this is a bit harsh. You know what? It, it's actually, it goes even further. The next day, God said to Moses, bring all those leaders. Bring all the leaders from all the 12 tribes. Bring a prominent leader from every tribe. Bring their staffs. Tell them that they've got to put their, give their staffs to you, and they put the staffs in front of the tabernacle. They left it there, and the next morning, Aaron's staff, a dead wooden stick, blossomed and had flowers on it. And they learned that you cannot go against the authority of God. You do not get elected by the people. You get elected and selected by God for this specific task, being a high priest. You know what's so interesting? This is chapter 16 and chapter 17. It says that Aaron, he knew. He was elected from among the people because he knew weakness. You know what really got me? Just a few chapters before that, just before they had the expedition into Canaan to see, in chapter 14, uh, 13 of Numbers, Numbers 13, they explored Canaan. You know what happened in Numbers 12? In Numbers 12, Aaron and Miriam, Moses' brother and sister rebelled against Moses. They didn't agree with everything Moses was doing, so they came and says that they, they rebelled against Moses. They talked against Moses because of his Cushite wife. This is Aaron. Miriam started the issue, brought it to Moses, uh, brought it to Aaron. Aaron said, let's go talk to Moses. They said to Moses, Moses, this is wrong. Moses said, I cleared it up with God. They said, no, this is wrong. We come against you. You can't do this. And then God said to Aaron and Miriam, come here. All three of you come to the tent of meeting. They came to the tent of meeting, and then in a moment, Miriam became leprous. Aaron asked Moses, he said, would you please pray for her? We cannot allow this. Ask God to forgive us for rebelling against you, Moses. And then Moses prayed for Miriam, and Miriam was healed. Quickly follow. When people rebelled against Aaron, God dealt with the people because God elects the high priest. He elects the high priest. But Aaron knew weakness. He, he rebelled against Moses. So what happened when Moses told Aaron, Aaron, run, go and stand in the middle of the people, ask God to forgive them. There's already 14,000 people dead. Ask God to forgive them. What happened to Moses? He knew what they went through. 
He didn't go with arrogance. No, that serves them right. You know, this is what they've done. They rebelled against me. I'm the man of God. Look at what happened, you know. He ran to them because he knew, he knew just a few chapters earlier. He knew I did the same. I know what it feels like to stand on the wrong side of this. And he ran and he asked God, forgive them. Why am I sharing this with you? I'm not. The Hebrew writer is. He's saying you've got to understand that a high priest gets elected from among the people because he has to be, he, he has to be in solidarity with them. He's got to understand them. He's got to understand their weaknesses. And because he understands their weaknesses and because he's elected by God. How was he elected? God said, Aaron, you're the high priest. Done. That settles it. Oh, God, but we think this guy, Korah, might be better. No, no, no. God said, Aaron. Hello? End of discussion. Let me put in a term, a term you guys understand. When we raise kids, there's a, a, one place where you get where it's, because I said so. A lot of discussion before that, but then at one point you just go, listen, because I said so. Hello? I know you guys never did it. It's just learn from my life. Because I said so, God elects the high priest. God places the authority, elects him from amongst the people. That's Aaron's, uh, that, that was what, what Aaron experienced. And because of that, because of that, he could have sympathy with them because he knew his own brokenness. He knew what it takes to stand before God and having bells around your cloak, moving into the, 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 the holy of holies, not knowing if you're going to be able to come out or not. You might die in the presence of God. He knew what it meant to sacrifice for his own sins first before he could bring sacrifice for the sins of the people. Aaron knew that. And therefore he had compassion with them. Hello? Do you get the picture that he's painting? Now read with me. Let's get back to Hebrews. Oh, that was the entry, intro. This is getting good, yeah. Listen to this. In chapter 5, he says this. After explaining this to them, he says in verse 3, this is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own, his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Verse 4, and no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was called by God. So called by God, elected from amongst the people. God shown, uh, shows himself to be with him, but also he's got to know what it means to be tempted by the same things he has to represent. And then in verse 5, in the same way. Would you, would you mind just saying that for yourself? If you want to say it silently, you can say it silently. If you want to say it out loud with me, let's say it out loud because there's a gear change here. In the same way. Listen to this. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 2, Psalm 110, over and over in scripture, it points to the fact that there will be a high priest that will surpass every other high priest, that will surpass any authority known before this. There will be one who will not be elected by humans. It will not be the people that have a vote and say, you know what, we, you know who we think should be our savior? We've got all these different religions. Let's, let's select which one we think has the most value. Let's determine who, who we want to be our savior. No, God said, it is Jesus. Because I said so. Uh, hello? No one comes to the Father except... <laughs> Come on. You guys know the word better than this. No one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus, through the Son of God. So is he elected? Come on. Let me help you. I know you guys are forgetting some simple scripture. Let me, let me help you. When Jesus was born, the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest. 
priests on earth. And if you want to translate it literally, it literally says, because God likes the people. What do you think it means? It's a favor on all mankind. God loves us, but He likes us. Are you getting it? And because of that, He said, listen, this is Him. This is Him. When Jesus was baptized, God answered out of heaven and, a, and, and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus and in an audible voice, God said, this is my beloved Son. This is Him. Every time man wanted to, you know, be uh, impressed with their own wisdom and guidance and the insight, even in the presence of God, God said, shh, listen to Him. Ask Peter. While they were sleeping and then in the presence of God and her glorification on the mountain, then Peter said, you know, should we build huts? God, God the Father literally said to him, shh, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about, man. Listen to him. Hello? Jesus is the elected one. Let me share this with you. You believe in Jesus or not makes no difference. Not to him. It makes difference to you. And to me, with salvation, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go on. At this stage, I just want to share with you the fact that Jesus is the high priest is open and clear and final in Scripture. He is the elected one. He is the one that represents people. Every single one that will come to him, he presents them before God. But this brings us to the second thing. What did they say? Every high priest what? Was elected from among the people. Jesus is, is perfect in every way. There's nothing to be added to him. With God, in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you see the high priest that will make an end to every other authority and every other reign of high priest. That high priest, Jesus Christ himself, has to fulfill everything. He's got to be elected from among the people. Hello? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to take the shape and to take the form of man. He didn't hold on to just the authority being in the heavenly realms. He became like us, walked amongst us to be tempted. Hello? To be tempted in every way. Let me read it to you. Verse 7, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with, with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You see, God had to say, listen, Jesus, Jesus had to say, Come, I'm going I'm, I'm to be born here on earth. God the Father said, I'm sending my son so that I can elect a high priest from among you that will be tempted in every way but sinless in every way. Hello? Why is this so important? What did it say about Aaron? He had to be elected from among the people so that? So that he could have understanding so that he could deal gently, verse 2, with those who are ignorant and going astray. We've got this picture that, you know, our high priest is going to deal, you know, it's a, it's a harsh judgment. No, no, no. He deals gently with us because he knows everything you are going through. He knows every temptation that comes your way. He knows that but he was obedient even unto death. The Hebrew writer here says, he points us to the fact where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he prayed, he says, during Jesus' days, uh, verse 7, uh, Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears 
Mark says that they could hear Jesus' loud cries as he says, Father, if possible, let this cup pass me by. Jesus was completely perfect. He knew perfection and holiness in every way, shape, and form. But still in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out. His tears, his his sweat became like like, like blood. He cried tears. And with with loud cries, he cried out, Father, if possible, let it pass me by. But not my will be done, but yours be done. And that's why this very next phrase makes sense, because if you don't understand it, it makes no sense. We'll read verse 9. And once made perfect. And once made perfect. Let me ask you, is Jesus perfect? Okay, let me ask you a different question. Was Jesus perfect from the very beginning? Is there ever going to be a time where Jesus is not perfect? No. So what is this? Jesus has always been perfect. You're right, by the way. There's never been a time or never will be a time where Jesus is not perfect. He's perfect, sovereign, most holy. But you see, he had to be made the perfect sacrifice. He had to be made the perfect high priest. That's why he had to come and live amongst us. That's why he had to see and experience the temptations that we experience. He had to to have those moments where he cried out, My flesh wants me to say, let this cup pass me by. My flesh wants me to say no. But my spirit, your perfection in me says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He was made perfect through his suffering. He was made perfect through his obedience. Hello? Jesus was made perfect as high priest by living amongst us, being tempted in everything, not sinning in anything, and still in the end saying, even when the ultimate price was there to pay, saying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus' prayer was answered. Listen to this, not my words. Listen to this. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him. In verse 7 it says, he cried with fervent cries, tears to the one who could save him from death, and he, and he was heard Because of his reverent submission. Verse 7. He was heard because of what? Because of his reverent submission. He was heard because he did not just say, Father, let this cup pass me by. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. Hello? And because of that, because of that, that prayer was heard. Father, not my will, but yours be done. The Father heard that prayer. He, it was heard, and it was done. And Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for you and for me and became the perfect sacrifice. After Jesus, there will never be any other high priest, no matter what election, no matter from what family, no matter from what tribe. It will not be from that. Just, just so that you know, it's not about election. It's not about a tribe. It's not about birthright. Jesus was from the the tribe of Judah. All other priests and high priests were from the tribe of Levi. But in Jesus, everything is fulfilled. We'll get to that when we talk about Melchizedek more. But because of Jesus' election, let me be clear. He was elected by God. God himself made that decision and gave himself. He was selected from among the people. That's why he lived amongst us. And because of that, now go back with me to chapter 4, verse 14. And we're we're ending with this. Because of that, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. What is the faith we profess? 
The faith we profess is that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and He came and lived amongst us and gave His life as a ransom for each and every one who will believe. That's our faith. Why do we hold on firmly to this faith? Because we know you can't change that if you believe or not. Christianity, there's going to be some seasons where it's popular. There's going to be some communities where there's so many Christians that you're in when you say you're a Christian. I know you don't know this, but you know, sometimes it's not going to be popular. Some countries, some seasons, people are going to want to elect themselves a high priest, a representative. They're going to want to, get, they're going to, want to elect themselves to determine their own journey, their own path, but it will always remain Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You might say, Piet, if you say it like that, it's offensive. The gospel is offensive. It's clear. It's truthful. We can't change it. By the way, I don't want to change that. But just so you know, can't change it. Jesus is our high priest, our representative. A sacrificial lamb. Listen to this. It says, Therefore we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's why every... Uh, uh, let, let, let me keep it broad. Man, man religion upon religion tries to reach godliness and holiness. There's only one way. It's for Him to gracefully give it to us. To graciously say, I've made you more than you think you can be by what I've done. It is only in Christ that we can stay. Or is there any one of us that can raise their hands and say, you know what, I made the cut. Peter, I can make it to the Father. I can make it to Him. Let me, let me share with you, you. You know as well as I do that we are fallen, we are broken. But in Christ, what do we receive? We embrace what He's given because we find mercy. Listen to this. Let us then approach the throne of uh, uh, God's throne, verse 16, of grace with confidence. Approach the throne of grace. Approach the throne of grace. We don't approach the throne of righteousness. We find righteousness in Christ. And then as righteous, we approach the throne of grace. Come on, you've got to get this. We don't approach the holiness of God and try to be holy. We don't try to be righteous and then we find our way to Him. We approach the throne of grace and He says, I'm asking, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, God, I want mercy. You know me. You see the brokenness of my life. Please have mercy on me. And God says through Jesus Christ, He says, listen, I have, I have mercy on you. I give you mercy. My grace is enough for you. And we approach His throne, not as people searching for righteousness. No, righteousness comes on this side of it. We receive His grace. We approach the throne of grace and we stand not in my righteousness, but in His righteousness. In Christ, my righteousness is firm. You don't have to come and share me my weaknesses. I, I, if you've got time, I'll share with you. You've got enough time, I'll share with you. I'm as broken as you can find. But He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in Him. Complete. Nothing to give, nothing to offer, but lacking nothing. Because my high priest is elected by Him. He's chosen from amongst us. And He's got mercy. And He's gracious towards us. I know I'm a crybaby. I'm sorry. But if you know what he saved me from, you'll cry too. It'll touch you too if you know where he, where he found me. I don't know where he found you. But man, he is all my righteousness. Never find yourself at a place where you're trying to approach the throne of righteousness. Oh, Moses, who made you the leader? Aaron, who made you the leader? We've got a few good guys here with us. We think that should be them. Be careful. 
Never get to a place where you get on your own throne and trying to make your own way to salvation. Only to be found in Christ. But let me share with you, you are good enough because you're not good enough. You are good enough because you believe. If you think you're good enough, you're not good enough. Okay, let me say that again. You are good enough because you're not good enough. But in Christ, you are enough because He's good enough. Gee, that was good. I love you. I know you hate this phrase, but there's an old song. (laughs) There's an old song that says, He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in Him. And I worship Him. Would you mind singing that with me? I don't know where you find yourself. I don't know. I just know wherever it is. That your high priest is enough. You've got a great high priest. It's better than Aaron by far. I know you. You know me. We are broken. But we are whole in him. Please do not approach the throne of righteousness with your own efforts. Please do not try to pick your own high priest. Only in Jesus. I'm going to ask Lisa and Nikkei to sing this for us. And while they do, this is between you and Him. If He's speaking to you this morning, you want to say, Lord, just this, just to testify to the fact that I know you are speaking in my heart this morning. You just react the way you want. If you want to keep sitting, you can sit. If you want to stand, you can stand. Let's just spend a bit of time in His presence.